Welcome to FBC. Thanks for tuning in. We pray that you will allow God's Word to speak to you, to encourage you, and transform your life. Thanks for watching. We're going to go to 1 Samuel 17. 1 Samuel 17. We're talking about real people with real faith, some of the greatest characters in Scripture, and today we come to most everybody's favorite, which is David, and we're going to see one of the great moments of his life where faith defeated giants. I'm going to begin reading in 1 Samuel 17, verse 45. 1 Samuel 17, verse 45. It says, Then David said to the Philistine, that's Goliath, You come to me with a sword and a spear and a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. Verse 46, this day the Lord will deliver you into my hand and I will strike you and take your head from you. And this day I will give the carcasses of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air and the wild beast of the earth. That's trash talking 3,000 years ago is what that is. that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Then all this assembly shall know that the Lord doesn't say with a sword or a spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. You may be seated. As you study this chapter, and I'm going to assume you're pretty familiar with this story, but it raises several questions. And it, the big question is this. What is the giant you're facing right now? What is the giant you're facing right now? Does it have to do with, with, with inside things like fear or anxiety or worry or doubt or depression or discouragement, addiction, obsessive thinking, anger? Maybe it's more external things like your finances, your job, your boss. Maybe it has to do with your health or the health of a family member. Maybe you're coming out of an ugly divorce and all that goes with that. Maybe you're dealing with loss. Maybe you're struggling with loneliness today. Maybe you just feel stuck in life. Maybe it, it, your challenge is family issues. Your mom, your dad, sibling husband, wife, your ex-husband, your ex-wife, your kids, your grandkids. Maybe it's just some difficult people you're dealing with in your life, some impossible people you've got to deal with. What are, what are the challenges? What are the giants you are facing? Because the reality is you will face giants. If you're not facing one right now, Hang on. You will. And the issue is, how are you going to face those giants? And David's going to show us a way that we can experience victory over the giants in our lives. And so we're going to look at, first of all, we're going to look at this passage through four lens. And first of all, we're going to look at the giants Israel was facing. The giants, plural, Israel was facing. What I find is this, when you get one giant in your life, usually it brings friends along with them. There's some other things that go with it. If you're dealing with this issue, there's some other things that come along with it. And Israel was facing four giants. First of all, war itself as a giant. War is, war is devastating to your country, your economy, your um, it's very difficult. It, it disrupts your daily life. It, it brings death to your young men. So they're dealing with war. Second, not only war in generally, general, they're dealing with war with the Philistines. Now, the Philistines weren't good at managing their country, but they were great at fighting. They were vile and violent and vicious. They were fierce and ferocious. They were uh, rude and crude and vulgar, and they were uh, 
skilled warriors and not people you want to fight, especially in the type of battles they had back then. So there's the war in general, there's the Philistines, and then there's this one Philistine named Goliath. And he is a giant. I uh, was thinking about this, and, and sometimes people will say, like, you know, that's some of these stories in the Bible, they're, they're not real, they're, they're good stories, they're fiction. It wasn't, maybe he was a big guy. He wasn't a, as big as the Bible says. The Bible says he was nine feet, nine inches tall. That's pretty tall. And you think back to the average man at that time was probably a, just a little over five foot tall. So he is a big giant. You say, well, that's just too big. Well, according to the, uh, the largest man in history, the tallest man ever found in history, uh, recent history, anyway, is a guy named Robert Wadlow. He was American. He was born in 1918, and he was 8 feet 11 inches tall. There's a picture of him there. See how much taller he is than an average man? He weighed 439 pounds at his death. He died at age 22. He was extremely strong, um, and he continued to grow all through that time. And they assumed that it had to do with an overactive pituitary gland, which produced way too much human growth hormone. And so he kept growing, but it's very unhealthy, and he died at the age of 22. So we know he existed, and 8 foot 11. So it's no stretch to believe that there was a man named Goliath who was 9 feet 9 inches tall. So that's who David is facing. And what's going on in, in this story is it's called battle by champion. They're fighting in the, they're, they're, they're gathered together in the valley of Megiddo, which in, the, in Revelation is referred to as Armageddon. And there's this big valley. There's Israel on one side, their soldiers. There's the Philistine army on the other side. And then every day, Goliath would come down and challenge the Israel army and say, send a champion to fight me. We will fight to the death, winner take all, and if we win, you become our slaves. If you win, we'll become your slaves. And so that is happening every day, twice a day for 40 days. Which brings us to the fourth giant they're dealing with, and that is fear. Because all the Israel soldiers are like, I'm not going to fight him. You fight him. <laughs> I don't want to fight him. They were scared to death of this guy. This guy had a reputation. He, he's the biggest killer, the greatest warrior in that part of the world at that time. Nobody wanted to fight him. It was a losing struggle. And I want you to understand that, that often the giant you're facing isn't that thing on the outside. It's how you're dealing with it on the inside. Fear is an inside job. And if you're looking at how big it is on the outside, often that affects how you deal with it on the inside. And so the question as we talk about giants, we can talk about the giants in general that we're dealing with, and we can talk especially about that giant of fear that many times we struggle with, that anxiety, that worry, that persistent uh, concern that it's not going to happen, it's not good enough, it's, the situation's just too hopeless, it's just too helpless. And there's a lot of things going on in our world right now that put us in a situation of fearfulness. They say anxiety, especially since COVID, is, is higher than ever, especially among younger people. So Israel is facing giants. They're not handling it well, so God sends a teenager to show them what to do. So let's look number two at the giant killer, and his name is David. David, the giant killer. And there's two big thoughts that, that I want to give you, and then we'll look at a little more detail. Um, the first big thought is this. God loves to use little, unlikely people, ordinary people, to accomplish extraordinary things. 
God loves to use little, unlikely, ordinary people to extra accomplish ordinary, extraordinary things. You look at yourself and you go, you can think of all the stuff you don't have. I'm not smart enough. I'm not talented enough. I'm not gifted enough. I have this liability. I have that that holds me back. And you can think of every reason why you can't. But God looks at you and he knows every reason why you can. And it's interesting, this guy, this David, this unlikely giant killer, he had several things that would normally be considered negatives. Number one, he was a teenager and not a man. Okay, this, is, this has got to be fighting the greatest warrior in the world, and you would at least think you'd send a grown man out to fight him and not a teenager. But you got to understand, God uses unlikely, ordinary uh, people to do extraordinary things. Do you realize every great movement, spiritual movement in history, almost every single one is traced back to teenagers, young adults? I mean, right now, going through the theaters was a movie called Jesus Revolution. Anybody see it? Can I see your hands? I recommend it to you. It's a good movie. It's about a bunch of young adults and teenagers who got excited about Jesus in Southern California in the 1960s and early 70s. And a movement was created that brought thousands of people, young adults in this country, into the kingdom of God. A hundred years ago, in the nation of Wales, which is part of Great Britain, it's a little nation, a coal mining nation at the time, a group of about 20 teenagers and one young adult began to believe God for revival. And 100, as a result, 100,000 people were saved in Wales, and they were really saved in one year. The revival was so powerful that it spread all through Great Britain and then Scandinavia and uh, Western Europe and then into Asia and Africa and South America, power uh, into the United States, unlikely teenagers. So we need to realize if God wants to do a great thing in our church, we need to make room and space for teenagers and young adults to have that opportunity. Number two, David was a shepherd, not a soldier. He wasn't even a soldier. He wasn't even part of the, the team. He's a shepherd. He's never fought a human in his life. He's not been trained. Interesting, he, when Christianity swept the known world in the first couple centuries, they did it without firing a shot, without killing anybody, without shedding a drop of blood. They did it out of love. Even secular historians commented on the fact that these guys are, they love each other so much and they love us, the pagans, so much. It's irresistible. God uses shepherds with big hearts more than uh, soldiers. And number three, David was God-centered, not self-centered. He was totally committed and not a casual chick, uh, Christian. It's interesting, this whole big, long chapter, 1 Samuel 17, nobody mentions God except David. None of the Israel soldiers, his brothers, they're not talking about God, but he only talks about God when he talks about what's going to happen. The fourth thing about David that is, uh, I'm sorry, the, the, those are three things about him, but the, the second big issue is this. The issue is not how big you are, but how big is your God. Not how big you are, but how big is your God. You see, this is what happens. We know we're this big. The giant, that big. We look at the giant, we get all intimidated and fearful and scared and paralyzed with our fear. But God is that big. Let me ask you a question. How big is God? You better know that. God is bigger than any giant you are facing, any giant you will face God is big enough. 
You may look at yourself and go, I, I, I can't fight that giant. It's just too big. But to God, it's nothing. He's infinite. You say, I'm not smart enough. God knows all things. I'm not strong enough. God has all power. I'm not able. God is unlimited in his abilities. The issue is not how big you are. The issue is how big is your God. When I was uh, 20, God called me to, to become a church planter and to go plant a church. And I prayed about where for several years. And, and God directed us to Columbus, Ohio. And uh, before we planted the church, I was 23 or 24, we came to Columbus and went up in the Rhodes Tower, the state building. So 41 stories high, we went up to the top of it and looked out. I'm from Chillicothe. The tallest building is four stories high, and the fourth story is just an attic win window up there. I looked out. I, was so, I saw all these houses, and I was so intimidated. I'm like, I can't plant a church here. That night, I ate dinner, and I was just anxious, and I took a walk, and the enemies just began trash-talking me. You can't do it. You're going to lose. It's not going to be any good. You're going to fail. No one's going to want to come to your church. Why would anybody come to your church? No one wants to listen to you. You're too young. You're too inexperienced. You don't know what you're doing. Forget it. And then God took me to this story. He said, I don't care how big your giant is. How big am I? And the answer he gave me, he said, I'm big enough. Look at me. You're online and you're struggling. Look at me. I want you to understand something. It doesn't matter how big your giant is or how many of them there are. God is big enough. God is big enough. God loves to use ordinary people to accomplish extraordinary things when they focus on God and not the giant, and when they walk in faith and not fear. What I did after that night is I said, I need to grow my faith to be greater than my fear. So I memorized 20 scriptures on faith. And every time the enemy would start trash-talking me, I'd just quote a scripture about faith. And how God can be trusted and how we, we, we can believe in him and, and the success that comes through faith. Well, we ended up starting that church and um, it did okay. We, we 26 years old, moved to, moved to Gehanna, moved on Saturday into an apartment complex on Sunday. There were 12 of us. We started in my basement, our basement. And 20 years later, we left 20 years later, and there were 2,000 people on, on Sundays. Yay, God. How does that happen? I certainly wasn't capable. But there is a God who is big enough. Well, let's look at the crowd. We looked at the giants. We've looked at David. Let's look, just look at the crowd for a second. I want you to understand something. When you're facing a giant, in some ways, you will be all alone in a crowd. You'll be the only, you, 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 you are going to have to deal with this, even in, if there's other people around sometimes. First group we see are the spectators, and those are the other soldiers, the other Israelite soldiers. They're not, they're not, fighting. They're standing around waiting for somebody else to fight. They're, they're fearful because they're focused on the giant. They're inactive because they're, they're focused on themselves. And I just want you to understand something. Spectators don't fight giants and spectators won't help you fight your giant. They're not going to help you. They're happy for you to fight your giant, but they're not going to really help you. Don't, don't count on spectators. Second, we get the critic, and that's David's older brother. The reason David was there in the first place was he was taking food from his father to his older brother, Eliab. 
And he shows up, and he's like, well, why doesn't it? David shows up and goes, why doesn't somebody fight that Philistine? His brother says, shut up. Uh, why did you even come? He, he's questioning David's motives. He mocks his inexperience. He says, you're, you're not even a soldier. You're just a shepherd. Why don't you go home and watch your little lambs? And then he accused his character. He says, well, you're just wicked and arrogant. Well, let me just tell you this. Don't listen to your critics. Nobody's ever erected a statue to a critic. <laughs> critics don't ever do anything for God. Listen to me. Being a critic is not a ministry. It's a hindrance to ministry. Critics tend to focus on the non-essential things. They get all caught up in, in minutia and they miss the big things that God wants to do. Don't listen to critics. Don't, don't count on spectators. Number three, we get the skeptic and that's Saul. Now, Saul was probably the only Israel, uh, Israeli soldier who had physically was, would be able to fight Goliath. He was like extraordinarily big, extraordinarily tall. And yet, he, he, he wasn't going to do it. He was unwilling to, to get involved. So they bring him David and said, this guy says he'll fight him. And he looks at him and, and he recognizes that David's way too young. He, he lacks any experience. And so he, he at least tries to give him his armor. He doesn't have the right equipment. And he's the skeptic. Skeptics tend to be those people that can tell you 10 reasons why whatever it is is not going to work. Yeah, but. That's their favorite phrase. Yeah, but. And uh, don't pay any attention to skeptics. Don't listen to your critics. Don't count on your spectators. You know, critics can, uh, and skeptics can really be discouraging. Prior to coming up here and scouting it out, when I was first called to plant the church, I was in my church. Guy was preaching on what he called say it faith and he went through the scriptures and showed the places where somebody God told them to do something and they declared it publicly and then then God began to bless that faith and so he said if God has called you to do something I want you to walk down here I want you to take the hand of one of these men here and I want you to tell them what God has called you to do declare your faith and I'm like ah God's like I called you to plant a church go go tell them so I went down there and the only guy the only opening was with this grumpy looking guy <laughs> and I shook his hand and I said God called me to plant a church and he looks at me and he goes what now I was 20 and I, I'm, I'm sure I looked like I was 15 or 16 he said what I said God called me to plant a church he said He said, are you sure? <laughs> I said, well, they told me I had to pray for you. God, help him. <laughs> that was the most discouraging trip to the altar I've ever taken in my life. I guarantee you, if you come today and you declare what God's called you to do, nobody's going to go, what? Amen. Don't listen to the skeptics. The fourth person in the crowd was obviously Goliath. And I want you to understand some things about Goliath. First, I mentioned he's big. He's really big. He's almost twice the size of everybody else. Second, he's relentless. As I said, he's challenging them twice a day. It would have been 40 days of this. They were broken down in discouragement. Number three, when the battle starts, he starts running up the hill towards David. Number four, he's experienced. This guy has killed more people than anybody else. He's a bloodthirsty, experienced killer. He's intimidating. He's a trash talker. The Philistine, Goliath said to David, come to me and I'll give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. And uh, he, he is definitely bloodthirsty. This is not a game. 
The odds were, humanly speaking, David's going to run down there and this guy's going to kill him and cut his head off. Hold the head up and then the Philistines would chase the, come after the Israeli army and make, try to make them slaves and try to make Israel a slave nation. So that's the crowd. We saw the giant killer. We saw the giants. The last thing I want you to see, and this is the part that especially matters, is the battle. And there's two parts to this battle. First of all, there's the preparation in David's life prior to the battle, and then there's the battle itself. So let's talk about the preparation first. The preparation, and let me just say this. My, my wrestling coach had this on a big banner in our wrestling room when I was in high school, and it said, preparation plus opportunity equals success. Preparation plus opportunity equals success. And the point is, you do your work, and you work hard preparing, and the coach will put you in situations where you have opportunity, and if you prepared, you will experience success. And for the most part, that was exactly true. The, the point is, if, if you're going to, listen to me, if you're going to win a battle tomorrow, you better be preparing today. Tomorrow's victory begins with today's victory. You need to, to be doing the holy habits that are going to get you ready to win the battles tomorrow. Listen, if you're not winning the battle of the blankets, what I mean by that is can you get out of bed to have spend time with God, read your Bible, pray? If you're not winning the battle of the blankets, don't think you're going to beat your giant. You need to develop the holy habits now that will see you through then. You need to build the, re the prayer life now that you can count on then. You need to have the faith, be building your faith now so that you will have the faith you need then. David was prepared. Let me tell you four things about David's preparation, and these are things he knew from experience. First of all, David knew who he was and whose he was. He knew who he was and whose he was. David said to the Philistine, Goliath, you come to me with a sword and a spear and a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. He says, I know who I am. I'm a representative of God. And I know whose I am. I belong to God. Look, if you have been truly saved and born again, you are the son or the daughter of the Most High God. You have authority at the throne of grace to receive grace and mercy to help you in your time of need. If you have been truly born again, you are a servant of the Most High God, and you've been sent on an assignment by Him, and He will give you the strength you need to do whatever it is you need to get done. If you have been truly saved and born again, you are a soldier of the cross, and you are not marching into battle all by yourself. God is, is going before you. God is going with you. God is going behind you. You are marching in victory, his victory, the victory Jesus won on the cross and, and sealed when he rose again from the grave. The greatest victory ever is yours. Look, you can defeat your giant. You can come through this better. God can do things that are bigger and better than you possibly can imagine, but you got to know who you are, and you got to know whose you are. You, don't waste time figuring out your identity. God's already told you your identity. Be who, be that. Number two, David knew the real issue. Goliath and the Philistine defied God. And was, we're hindering the work of God, and we're hindering the testimony of God. 1 Samuel 17, 26, uh, David shows up and he says, well, who's that uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? 1 Samuel 17, 47, 
David said, I'm going to defeat uh, Goliath, and then all this assembly will know that the Lord does not say by a sword or a spear, but the, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into my hands. Listen, the issue you're facing may not be spiritual in its birth. Maybe it's cancer. Maybe you lost your job. Maybe uh, there's something going on that, that, that you don't have uh, financially that you have no control over. It may not have its birth in something spiritual, but I want to guarantee you the enemy will come and attach to that and make it a spiritual issue. And David had to fight a real person, Goliath, but he said the bigger issue, this is a battle between light and darkness and goodness and evil. And so you got to see the spiritual and realize that, that as far as what's going on inside of you, the battle is not against flesh and blood, but it's against principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in high places. It's against Satan. It's against his demons who are trying to defeat and discourage you and to, to get you so that you do not take and claim and experience the victory Jesus has for you. David knew the real issue. Number three, David knew what he had already done. David had already killed the lion. He had already killed a bear. He said, your servant has killed. He says to Saul, your servant's already killed a lion and a bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one more. See, he has defied the armies of the living God. Moreover, David said, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of the Philistine. Look, he had a track record of victory. You need to, to, you say, I'm not facing any big giants right now. Good. You need to start winning some battles right now. You need to not lose the battles over temptation, the battle over gluttony, the, the battle over addiction, the battle over using your time, the battle over uh, how you think, the battle over bitterness, the battle over fear, the battle over worry. You need to be winning these battles now so that you will be able to have a track record of victory that you'll take into when you face a real giant, a big giant. Number four, David knew the power available in the name of the Lord. We just sang about the power of the name of Jesus. David knew that the power to succeed didn't come from him. He understood this. I may only be this big. Goliath, the giant, may be that big. But God is how big? Big enough. big enough. David said to the Philistine, you come at me with a sword and a spear, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts and the God of the armies of Israel, who you had defied. Then the Lord will deliver you into my hands. I'm going to strike you, and I'm going to take your head from you, and I will give the carcasses uh, to the camp of the camp of the Philistines, to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the field, for all the earth will know that there is a God in Israel. Then all this assembly will know that the Lord doesn't say by a sword or a spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and He will give you into our hands. He knew God was big enough. Listen to me. I want you to actually say the words with me. And when I ask the question, you're facing a giant right now that is bigger than you can handle, more complex than you can figure out, that, that, that's like an octopus maybe with a tentacles you can't even get your arms around. You're facing a giant right now that's like a Goliath staring you down, ready to cut your head off. Let me ask you a question. Not how big are you. Let me ask you a question. How big is God? Big Let me ask you again. How big is God? This week, when intimidation, when the enemy starts trash-talking you, how big is God? Big you better know the answer to that question. Well, that's the preparation. Let's look at the confrontation, and, and it's really pretty simple. David threw off all the hindrances he had. What I mean by that is Saul tried to put his armor on him, and he, it didn't fit, and he wasn't used to it, and he got rid of it. It's a good t lesson to us to get rid of the things that are hindering you. Look, if, if, if you've got a relationship that's holding you back with God or a friendship that's dragging you down or 
You've got a habit that's not holy or you've got an addiction that is, keeps tripping you up. If you're bound up in fear and doubt, if it's an old hurt, a bitterness, a anger, let go of your hindrances. Walk today in a fullness of victory that you have in Christ. Don't, don't hang on to any, anything that's not going to help you. Life is too short to, to be all bound up in a bunch of worthless stuff, unimportant things. Second, David gathered his resources. It says in 1 Samuel 17, 40, he went and he got five smooth stones. There, there was a, in this valley, there was a, a, a creek down in there, a dry creek bed. He got five smooth stones. You say, why did he get five? Well, we read on in Samuel, 1 and 2 Samuel, we find out Goliath had four relatives who were giants. So he's got five stones. He's got one for all of them. He's ready. He's got his resources. He's prepared. He gathers his resources. Number three, David ran towards the enemy. When it's time to act, listen, there's a time to act. A lot of us wait and wait and wait, hoping the giant will go away. And the giant doesn't go away. If you're going to defeat this giant, you're going to have to face this giant. Some of you have been putting off something you know you need to do. Do it. Number four, uh, David took his shot. He's got a sling with a stone in it, and he takes his shot. Now, you've got to understand something. Somebody with an a enlarged pituitary gland tends to have a very large forehead. You ever see Andre the Giant, those of you intellectuals that watch big-time wrestling? <laughs> you, ever, you ever seen his forehead? It's huge. Goliath most likely had a very big forehead. Hard to get a helmet that's going to fit that head. And when he's laughing at David and tips his head back, perfect shot. David nails him right in the forehead. The, the stone goes into the forehead and drops him. And David runs up and grabs his sword and cuts his head off. David took his shot. And there comes a point where you need to take your shot, and then David finished the job. Cuts his head off, holds the head up. The Israel army is so excited, they come running down the hill, and they chase the Philistines all the way back to, to uh, their homes. David finished the job. Once you get start experiencing victory, don't relax. Follow through until the job is done. So what have we said today? We've said this. You will face giants. Maybe you or somebody you love regarding your health, regarding your finances, regarding your job, regarding your, your relationships, regarding your family. You will face giants. And if you're not careful, the real enemy will become an inside enemy that's going to, you got this going on on the outside, it's going to become an inside thing that's going to turn into an addiction, it's going to turn into uh, fear, it's going to turn into ag anxiety, it's going to turn into depression, it, maybe it's an old hurt, it's going to turn into bitterness. And these things don't shrink, they, they grow if they're not dealt with. Some of you have been bound up in fear way too long. Goliath has been trash-talking you over and over, and today's the day to say enough of that. What have we said? If you look at your giant, it looks really big, but you look at God, you realize that he is how big? Yeah. Big enough. Big enough. Some of you, God has told you something you need to do, and you need to walk down here and take the hand of uh, one of these good-looking, positive people here behind the altar, and you need to say, this, I, this is what God's called me to do. Declare your faith. Well, let's bow our heads, can we?
And let me ask you one or two questions before we pray. If you would say, you know what, Dave, I'm very thankful I was here today because I'm facing a giant or some giants right now. And I needed this, and I need God's help to deal with this giant or these giants. Would you lift your hand up real high and say, God, I need your help with this. All around this room, just hold them up real high. Don't think that you're the only one. There's a lot of hands up right now. Just hold it up there. Need your help, God. I can't do this on my own. Thank you. You may put it down. I wonder who would say, you know what, my big... The giant that I'm dealing with has is, is gotten inside. It's fear, it's anxiety, intimidated. Would you hold your hand up real high? Discouraged. Just hold it up. Say, God, I need your help with this. You may put it down. One last question. Maybe the giant that you're seeing and dealing with has to do with somebody you love, a family member, and you're just asking God for grace of how you can do your part to see victory. Would you raise your hand real high? How can you do your part to see victory? Lots of us, lots of us today. You may put him down. Father, in the name of Jesus, you saw our hands and, and you see our hearts and we declare we need you. We definitely need you when it comes to these things, God. We cannot hope to have victory without you. God, pour out your grace right now. We say no to fear. We say no to to anxiety. We say no to depression. We say no to discouragement. We say no to anger. We say yes to faith and victory in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for watching today's message. If you have any questions or comments, or if you made a decision for Christ, please reach out to us at info at firstgc.org. That's info at firstgc.org. Thanks again for watching.